Vice Marshal of the University, it is my honor to declare open the proceedings of the 525th Convocation of the University of Chicago and to introduce the University's 13th President, Robert J. Zimmer. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome. As the Marshal has just announced, today's ceremony is the 525th time that the University of Chicago has assembled for a convocation. These convocations allow students to be recognized and celebrated for their achievements after completion of their studies and to do so through a formal celebratory ceremony. The degrees to be awarded this afternoon I confer by authority delegated to me by the University's Board of Trustees, and I do so on behalf of the faculty of the University of Chicago that has responsibility for the educational programs recently completed. While the primary purpose of convocation is to award degrees, these occasions satisfy other objectives as well. At convocation number one, on January 2nd, 1893, the university's first president, William Rainey Harper, set out other important goals for these ceremonies. Harper believed these occasions of high ceremony to be a necessary and nourishing part of the life of the university and intended them to call together all parts of the university community. In Harper's words, convocations are meant to bind together into a unity the many complex and diverging forms of activity which constitute our university's life and work. Today's ceremony, then, is also about reflecting upon the whole of what we do across the many libraries, laboratories, and classrooms that make up our campus. It affords us all a moment to reflect upon the accomplishments of our past and the opportunities for our future, individually, collectively, and institutionally. Such a moment is particularly meaningful today, as this year we mark the 125th anniversary of the founding of the University of Chicago, and today's convocation is the culmination of our 125th anniversary celebration, which has taken place over the course of this order, autumn quarter. Over these 125 years, the University of Chicago has been and continues to be a distinctive institution with a history of remarkable achievement and a particular view of and commitment to education and research. In recognition of this milestone in our history, I'm pleased to introduce a colleague who has left an indelible imprint on the University of Chicago. She is here today to deliver the 125th anniversary address. It is my privilege to introduce the 10th president of the University of Chicago, the university's third longest serving president, and the Harry Pratt Judson Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of History, Hannah Holborn Gray. During her 15 year presidency from 1978 to 1993, President Gray was a tireless and forceful advocate and actor on behalf of the fundamental values of the University of Chicago as a place of free expression and open discourse, the seriousness of purpose of our research and education activities, and the meaning of this institution as one that adhered in an uncompromising way to the standards of rigor and depth of analysis. This was manifest in her insistence upon the very highest standards in scholarly quality and achievement in faculty appointments, her initiation of important structural reforms in Chicago's doctoral programs, her expansion of the college leading to a more robust and energized college education, and her expansion of the university's professional schools with the establishment of the Harris School of Public Policy Studies. Beyond her work at the university, President Gray became a nationally respected spokesperson on the role of universities in society. She articulated very powerfully that through their fundamental purposes of research and teaching, universities have a major cultural and intellectual role in enriching our society and nation. And that to fulfill that role, universities must resist ideological and political positions 
she defended and protected the ideal of academic freedom vigorously and courageously. In this way, she was a model for her colleagues, a role that she continues to play. Professor Gray's scholarship, deep commitment to higher education, and myriad other accomplishments have earned her numerous awards and honors, including the Medal of Liberty in 1986 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1991. As a leader, educator, and researcher, President Gray represents the highest aspirations of the University of Chicago, and I'm very pleased that she has joined us today to deliver the 125th anniversary address. Following her remarks will be a piece of music commissioned by the university in honor of our 125th anniversary. Twin Spaces Intertwined was composed by Anthony Chun, assistant professor of music at the University of Chicago, co-artistic director of the Talia Ensemble, and the Daniel R. Lewis Young Composer Fellow at the Cleveland Orchestra. This piece will be performed by the Civic Orchestra of Chicago and conducted by Michael Lewanski, the Assistant Professor of Instrumental Ensembles at DePaul University School of Music. And now to deliver the 125th anniversary address, please join me in welcoming Professor Hannah Holborn Gray. Thank you very much. And let me begin by congratulating all those who, assuming you have not let your library fines go unpaid, will receive degrees at this anniversary convocation. I will also remind you of a prominent trademark of our university, namely the near impossibility for its members ever to agree on any issue at all. That includes the question of whether 2015 is, in truth, our 125th anniversary. The trustees of the university decreed early on that the founding should be dated from July 1st, 1891, the day William Rainey Harper took office as a president and began with ferocious energy and imagination to organize a new University of Chicago. Hence, the fifth anniversary was held in 1896, the 10th in, 1890, in 1901, and so on. A scholarly of argumentative faculty committee concluded that our 100th birthday be celebrated over the course of the academic year 91-92 and end on the first day of classes, which took place on October 1st, 1892. Until recently, Chicago's sweatshirts and memorabilia, the kind you bought at the bookstore, instead of books, sported the university seal on the date 1892. These have now vanished. The new merchandise is decorated instead with the logo U Chicago 1890, a sort of perpetual email message that is rudely rejected by my spell, spell check. I hasten to add, however, that there is most certainly a significant case for 1890 because the university was incorporated in that year. So one can date its legal existence from 1890, its academic beginnings from 1891, and its actual operation as a university with students from 1892. As we scan the landscape of higher education, it becomes clear that all universities, whatever their similarities, have their own DNA, a distinctive character and tradition shaped by and in their foundations. You may have heard of the child who, when asked what a molecule is, described it as a thing too small to be seen by the naked observer. But since we all seem quite decently robed this afternoon, I think it an appropriate time to reflect briefly on some major strands of Chicago's constituent DNA. For that is what universities are about to recall a university's roots, to summon the driving imperatives and basic principles that have shaped its mission, and to reconfirm their active presence in our familiar world. The university's 10th anniversary was a magnificent occasion, filled as this past quarter has been, with lectures and conferences, speeches, concerts, and exhibitions, building dedications, and the laying of cornerstones. 
Mr. Rockefeller joined in. And at a special convocation like this one, exhorted graduate student, graduating students to work hard and to stay absolutely clear of alcohol. President Arpur found, it in, the, found in the event an important opportunity to look back at what had been accomplished since 1891 and to reiterate the goals of his original plan for the university. In a lengthy report, he expressed pride that the university had become an institution of the first rank in a remarkably short time, garnering full respect from those who had initially been very skeptical of his project. He described the growth of the university, its faculty, students, administration, buildings, budgets, resources. And in comparing what had been completed and what had yet to be done, he spoke of having still to create schools of engineering, of music, of art, and of getting a proper medical school. And he also spoke of needing to find ways to free more faculty time for scholarly and scientific investigation. But this decennial report was much more than a record of past progress and future aspirations. On the one hand, Harper was judging his university in terms of its founding principles. On the other, he was speaking of where it had fallen short or where initial plans needed to be rethought. It is here that we can begin more closely to detect the university's specific DNA. In Harper's words, we can glimpse the distinctive combination of the commitment to tradition and the commitment to innovation that have accompanied its history. And we can discern also the intensely critical spirit that has animated not only the university's intellectual life, but its continuing impulse toward self-examination. From the outset, Harper had linked his university to a tradition of centuries. In the neo-Gothic architecture of the campus, he saw expressed a fraternal link with the European universities of the Middle Ages. As he prepared for opening day, Harper insisted that the work of the university would begin, and here I quote him, would begin October 1st, as if it were the continuation of a work which had been conducted for a thousand years. Yet despite his reverence for tradition, Harper had set out, above all, to challenge tradition. He wanted to create a university, not a college from which might eventually evolve a university, as in the case of most, not all, but most American universities of his time. The University of Chicago did not just happen. It was planned. It was born as a university. And this has proved a decisive fact that has much to do with making our university an institution remarkably faithful to its founding spirit, consistent over time, in an unusual singleness of focus and clarity of mission. Harper proclaimed that his plan, and here I quote him again, would re revolutionize college and university work in this country. It is, he said, brand splinter new, and yet solid as the ancient hills. The university idea is to be emphasized. In short, Harper wanted a research university within which a college might flourish, a university where graduate study, research, and scholarship would offer an environment framed for students and faculty alike by the highest intellectual standards and by goals that nourish strong individualism, personal independence, and an expansive range of differing views. While at the same time, he was encouraging a clarity of focus, an agreement of institutional priority among its different faculties. Hence Harper's formula of one in spirit, if not in opinion, as he put it, as the essential ethos for a university which, however powerful in its different schools and departments, might make its intellectual space a fertile source of unusual interdisciplinary breadth, one in which it was possible to cross boundaries that in most universities blocked their different faculties from productive communication with one another. Harper wanted to make the whole of this university somehow larger than the sum of its parts. It was his goal to make that sense of the whole triumph in the service of intellectual risk-taking and innovative scholarship, to make that an organic dimension 
of the university's permanent culture. The freedom of thought and expression essential to encouraging the effective vitality of these academic goals was another principle he highlighted in his decennial review. He said, when for any reason the administration of the institution or the instruction in any of its departments is changed by an influence from without, when an effort is made to dislodge an officer or professor because the political or the religious sentiment of the majority has changed, at that moment, the institution has ceased to be a university. Harper saw this freedom as an immutable condition of professorial tenure, offering security and thought and expression to any tenured professor, even when, as he put it, and I quote, he fails to exercise that quality ordinarily called common sense, which it must be confessed, in some cases, the professor lacks. I don't know what was in his mind when he said something like that, but he was certainly very clear that it was for independent-minded individuals and not for the university as an institution to take political positions. The corporate entity could not presume to speak for or against the views of its individual members, however wise or wrong-headed they might be. Harper's decennial message was not simply celebratory. He emphasized the importance of the critical spirit in approaching questions of university policy and practice. He favored publishing and making public more rather than less information, of sharing publicly accounts of problems as well as achievements, telling it like it was, even he said, telling it to the press, a press that had so often, he complained, been ridiculously unfair to the university. You can practically see him gritting his teeth as he wrote that. But he was declaring, and it is important, that openness and candor and vigorous debate, although he and everyone else might find them difficult or uncomfortable, should always be essential hallmarks of our university. The history of our university has not been one of unbroken progress. There have been times of trouble and constraint and even of unresolved conflict. The university has had to review and reconstitute itself in their wake. And that has helped, I think, to reinforce the seriousness and rigor that have identified this university at critical moments with thinking about the nature of higher education. At this anniversary, the university stands out still as an institution that knows its mission, that represents for many what a university can truly represent, and that has sustained its core values amidst the larger shocks and aftershocks that have recurrently affected all of higher education. We are presently at a time, and it is not the first, when the quality, the performance, and the directions of higher education and its institutions have come under intensive and often hostile questioning. Universities have become more complicated and more central to the larger society than could have been imagined at the 50th anniversary when Robert Hutchins asked whether the private research university could even survive. Or at the 75th anniversary, when with Edward Levy about to assume the presidency, the mounting sounds of the protests that were to mark his era revealed deep rifts within the academic community. Hutchins led both at home and in the national community of academia with his steadfast defense of academic freedom and of the university's mandate when they were under attack. A university, he said, must stand for something. And that must be something other than what a vocal minority or majority demand at the moment. And Edward Levy, in the face of a radical movement that aspired to remake the university into an instrument of social and political protest and action, was equally steadfast in speaking to his profound belief that universities are, as he put it, the custodians not only of the many cultures of humanity, but of the, of the rational process itself. The point of our ceremony today, in reasserting the continuity of its founding principles, is not to invoke a false nostalgia or a foolish resistance to change. 
It is rather to say that to be reminded of the university's origins and history is to be reminded of the university's underlying and enduring strengths, and to hope that future change will proceed in harmony with the essential guidance these offer. You have perhaps heard of yet another child who, when asked to explain the fall of the Roman Empire, replied, peer pressure. American higher education is not exactly the Roman Empire, but there is a significant lesson here. Too often, in the current state of higher education, the abundant temptations of submitting to peer pressure have resulted in an all too evident pursuit of faddish or conformist, or in the mere desire to avoid trouble at all costs, or to engage in forms of competition among our universities that will scarcely enhance the robust quality and autonomy of distinctive centers of educational excellence. We are seeing, and too often, a capitulation of ratings wars into an increasingly distracted and consumerist outlook coming both from within and from out higher education itself. But on this occasion, of our 123rd, 124th, and 125th anniversaries rolled into one, we can, I believe, state the expectation, and indeed the confident belief, that the University of Chicago will remain faithful to its dominant purposes, that it will retain a distinctive identity within the larger academic universe, that it will be unafraid to talk the life and the freedom of the mind as its raison d'etre, and that it will be able to resist the lur always lurking dangers of complacency, insularity, and humorless, humorless self-regard. Finally, it is worth remembering that the core principles and goals of the university, if they are to have genuine life and consequence, require reaffirmation and new realization in each phase of its history. Anniversaries give us a useful, if perhaps arbitrary, way to do just that, as does the ceremony today, in which the different parts of the university have come together as one assembly, embodying Mr. Harper's search for a unity of spirit. Thank you.
Please join me in another round of applause for faculty member Anthony Chung, who composed this powerful and special piece. As provost of the University of Chicago, it is my privilege to introduce Judith B. Farquhar, who will present today's convocation address. She is the Max Pilevsky Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and of Social Sciences in the college, as well as the University of Chicago alumna. A leading expert on traditional medicine in China, Professor Farquhar's extensive anthropological fieldwork in China includes research topics such as self-care techniques in Beijing and family illness management in rural China. Professor Farquhar has been a member of the University of Chicago faculty since 2004. She served as chair of the Department of Anthropology from 2009 to 2012, and she has been noted for her excellence in teaching throughout her career, receiving prestigious teaching awards from both the University of Chicago and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is presently a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities at the National Humanities Center in North Carolina, where she is working on a forthcoming book, Gathering Medicines in the Mountains, Healing, Knowledge, and the State in South Southern China. She is the author of numerous publications and has presented lectures around the world on traditional medicine, the body, and social thought. The title of her talk today is Slowing Down Reason. Please join me in welcoming Professor Judith Farquhar, the 525th Convocation Speaker. President Zimmer, Provost Isaacs, faculty, colleagues, graduating students, families, and friends. It is an honor to address you at this convocation. This event not only marks a transition for students, it also recalls 125 years of university history, including many generations of scholars, teachers, and other curious people. We can all feel today as if we've been a small part of that history. Almost 30 years ago, I stood in this exact spot receiving my PhD in anthropology with my parents in the audience marveling that one of us for the first time in our large family had received an advanced degree. By that time, the University of Chicago had trained me in one of its noble traditions, critical social research. I had learned slowly to reason with discipline and to study with care. So to those of you who are leaving this community now, I cannot resist offering some advice. Take care and go slow. This is homely advice, much like that your parents and grandparents would urge on you as you're heading out the door, especially if you're driving. Take care and go slow. Why care? Why go slowly? Amid all the urgencies and crises of our time, when domestic security seems more important than global engagement, when science fiction is more appealing than science, when boastful ignorance gathers more media attention than sober information, when short-term gain is preferred over long-term cultivation, when the quick factoid is so much easier to collect than anything that might be more deeply true, why should we bother to care every day in many small ways about our environment, our communities, faraway places, views expressed in foreign languages? Why should we still discipline ourselves to slow and thoughtful investigation? Why should all of us in and outside of the academy care enough to take the time every day in many small ways to study and study some more, to think and think again? When not quite 30 years ago I was here in Rockefeller Chapel getting my degree, I had been teaching in the college core for most of a year. I taught two sections of self-culture and society as a Harper Fellow and I've taught in that sequence many times since. In self, as it's sometimes called, we teach classic social theory, economics, sociology, anthropology, psychology, history, critique. And yes, I did say theory. I'm sure all of you have seen the t-shirt. That's well enough in practice, but how does it work in theory? That's so University of Chicago. In that year of teaching self, I decided to include an essay by the mid-20th century Italian philosopher and anti-fascist activist, Antonio Gramsci. Writing from Mussolini's prison, Gramsci made a distinction between common sense and good sense. He argued that in certain respects, everyone is already a philosopher, whether we intend to be one or not. 
Even when we make no effort, we are already participants in the common sense philosophy that is contained in our language. Language imposes its unconscious notions and concepts on us, he said. There is a mundane common sense that is haphazard and disconnected. Gramsci says we are all products of a historical process that has left an infinity of traces gathered together without the advantage of an inventory. But his essay insists that we could all be better philosophers, moving beyond mere common sense. With more attention to history and a deeper engagement in the long and difficult task of thinking rationally, we could work out our own conception of the world consciously and critically. We could choose our own sphere of activity and participate actively in the history of the world. Gramsci, in all his writings, devoted close attention to history, and his writings raised many questions that historians, sociologists, and anthropologists later followed up with social research, some of it in the noble University of Chicago tradition. Social research is a form of collective reasoning of the conscious and critical sort Gramsci advocated, and it is slow. Could slowness be a virtue? There's a much more recent philosopher now being taught in my department, Isabel Stengers, who argues as much. Stengers, like Gramsci, is also a historian, but she was trained as a scientist. Her first major works were authored with Ilya Prigozhin, a physical chemist, and her, in her more recent writings about the sciences, she has insisted that certain habits of work and thought set the basic sciences apart from ordinary common sense. Instead of challenging the claims of scientific research to provide us with reliable facts about nature, as some popular critics have done, Stengers has called on all of us, scientists, philosophers, citizens, to slow down. Here's the opening sentence of one of her influential articles. How can we present a proposal intended not to say what is or what ought to be, but to provoke thought, a proposal that requires no other justification than the way it is able to slow down reasoning and arouse a slightly different awareness of the problem and situations mobilizing us. What kinds of problems and situations did she have in mind? What would a slightly different awareness of these urgent situations look like? There are a few examples referred to in her article, but it's easy for us to supply our own. Even in our American bubble, we're becoming inured to scientific and humanitarian crisis, gun violence, melting glaciers and rising oceans, acute global infections, a chronic state of war in too many places. Sometimes we feel that we've run out of ways to think about these crisis situations. We are hyper aware not only of emergencies, but of our own ignorance about the real reasons for them. We watch our leaders organize action, and we feel collectively like idiots. In fact, Stengers proposes that we pay more attention to the idiots among us. Borrowing from Dostoevsky and Melville, she describes the idiot as the one who always slows the others down, who resists the consensual way in which the situation is presented, and who has doubts about the ways thought or action are demanded in rapid response. This word idiot impresses me as a pretty good description of some of your professors here, and some of you may agree. Having read Stengers, though, I'm tempted to declare that I am an idiot and proud of it. It is the work of the idiot to ask with Stengers, what are we busy doing with our weapons, our biotechnology, our fossil fuels, our information technology? What's the point? What do we hope to accomplish beyond putting out fires? It is the work of the idiot to insist in college classes, in careful scholarship, in laboratory and field research, in public forums, that there is something more important than the panicky urgencies that fill the airwaves. Stenger's idiot insists on this even though she cannot be certain what it is exactly that is more important. The idiot slows down reason so that bigger questions can be asked, so that public problems can be taken at a different pace and with slightly different results. Like Gramsci's everyman, the philosopher understands what it is to be, for a time, an idiot. Good sense is not lazy like common sense. It is not an easy job being an idiot. The philosopher with good sense devotes time and effort to learning, she brings a hard-won preference for coherence or reasoning to the task of acting in a crisis. As students and scholars, it has taken some time for all of us to get to this day in this place. We have read the many positions taken in many debates. 
we have improved our methods of gathering and evaluating information. We have struggled with ways to justify and refine our intuitions. We have interrogated the design of experiments, and we have wrangled works of art into existence. This has been deliberate work. It has been slow reasoning. Now that you're graduating, will this deliberateness continue? Is there any place for slow reasoning in your futures, in your new positions as professional scientists, creators, teachers, entrepreneurs, administrators, public servants of all kinds and all over the world? Will the University of Chicago's particular brand of idiocy still be required? It will if you care and if you take care. Let me close then with another proposal one that sits comfortably alongside Gramsci's appeal for good sense and Stanger's call to slow down reasoning. This comes from Michel Foucault in an interview published under the title The Masked Philosopher. Curiosity, he says, is a new vice that has been stigmatized by Christianity, by philosophy, and even by a certain conception of science. Curiosity is too often a synonym for futility. The word, however, pleases me. To me, it suggests concern. It evokes the care one takes for what exists and could exist, a readiness to find strange and singular what surrounds us, a tendency to break up our familiarities and to regard the same things otherwise, a fervor to grasp what is happening. He goes on, I dream of a new age of curiosity. We have the technical means for it. The desire is there. The things to be known are infinite. The people who can employ themselves at this task exist. We must multiply the paths and the possibilities of comings and goings. Foucault dreams of a new age of curiosity, of care, of concern. Having been both student and teacher at the University of Chicago and having been encouraged in that University of Chicago way to indulge my curiosity and to regard the same things otherwise again and again, I believe with him that all of us not only have the desire to continue to learn, but we have the technical means for it. Multiplying the comings and goings of our knowledge and our reasoning is slow and careful work. As we disperse many of you to new lives of effective work in many fields, let me urge you again, take care and go slow. As we begin the presentation of degrees, may I call your attention to the award of honors listed in the convocation program, as well as the names of candidates receiving degrees today in absentia. At this time, in the favoring presence of this congregation here assembled, the deans of several faculties or their appointed representatives will present the candidates for academic degrees to the president of the university. The dean of the college, will now present candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science in programs in the college. Mr. President, these students have completed the prescribed program of undergraduate studies. And on behalf of the faculty of the college, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science and welcome you to the Fellowship of Educated Individuals. Jamal Lamont Cameron. Florence Chan, Colleen Anna Cummings, Erica Catherine de Temmerman, Aaron Michelle Domenici, Raymond Matthew Dong, Patricia Aurora Fernandez Pineros, Ryan William Gruber. Joseph Seton Houghton, Ya Young Jung, Kirsten Margaret Kazin, Xiao Rim Kim, Charles Jacob Koenig, 
Charles Stanislas Kozlowski, Amy J. Lee, Jose Noe Lee, Kaki Karen Lynn, Catherine Ann Murray, Shmita Harsha Mut, Oluwasho Olugengbe, Mary Christine Pierce, Thomas Green, Tig Rob, Kevin Alondo Rodriguez, Mackenzie Lee Smith, Yesha Basil Somer Simpson, Andrew Jungwa Song, Prashant Sundarshan, Seth Michael Weintraub, Alejandro Charles Younger, and Michael Zhao. Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting a student marshal in the class of 2015. Appointed for her excellent record in academic studies and her contributions to the university and its community, she has served with distinction as a student marshal. Alvin Bora. The Dean of the William B. and Catherine B. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Liberal Arts and Master of Science in programs in the Graham School. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Liberal Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the liberal arts, and by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Liberal Arts, and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Kimberly Eisman Feld. Michael Hans Paulson. Holly Timms Stauffer. <laughs> Mr. President, these students have completed the program of study prescribed by the faculty of the Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Science. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in your profession, and by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Science. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Debtash Benariji. Shelby Lee Bridges. Edward Stephen Evans. Maura Joan Foley. Cornelius Hubbard. Sanuj Kumar. Mylan B. McGraw. Donna Grace Schrader. Anthony Yerzidi. Melissa Rose Villa, Bowden Zhang. The Dean of the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine will now present a candidate for the degree of Master of Science and candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine.
Mr. President, this student has completed the program of studies prescribed by the Faculty of the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine and the special program approved by her department. I now have the honor to present her as a candidate for the degree of Master of Science. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the biological sciences. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Science. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Jacqueline Francis Handley. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Robert Kenneth Arthur. Catherine Emma Locke. Celia Giletta Fernandez. Laura Alida Merwin. The Dean of the Division of the Humanities will now present candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Humanities. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Humanities, I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Eric Paul Job. Joshua Lee Mabra. Martina Martinovich. Meredith Rosamond Aska McBride. Elizabeth Ann Pareto. Renu Roychaduri, Tristan James Schweiger. The Dean of the Division of the Physical Sciences will now present candidates for the degree, degrees of Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Physical Sciences. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Physical Sciences and the special programs approved by their departments. I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Science. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the physical sciences. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Science, and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Jiaming Dong, Mu Du, Kiyun Duan, Minji Fun, Eric Feng. Bao Fu, Yuan Gao, Juyan Guan, Xiorun Guan, Shi He, Mai Hu, 
Chang Jiang, Mingji Jiao, Itichai Kojantanake, Lingdu Kung, Scott Daniel Kramer, Nathan Kenneth Layla, Lingu Lung, Nanju Li, Shirong Li, Shijong Li, Yu Fang Li, Yu Chung Li, Junshi Liang, Wu Hun Lin, Xin Liu, Jun Lu, Liang Ma, Mayank Mandava, Yinan Mao, Stephen Arthur Meyer, Ali Mushudikin, Risu Na, Adri Nasadin, Yating O, Shi Yaohong Pu, Daniel Orturo Rico, Jasmine Tan, Yue Tang, Bing Chen Wang, Chen Wu Wang, Helen Wang, Rune Hao Wang, So O Wang, Yi Wang, Stephanie Kelly Warner, Shi Yao Shen Wen, Tian Bu Wu, Wei Wu, Qi Xia, Yi Fan Xiao, Fang Chao Xie, Cheng Zhu, Winzi Zhu, Jin Yang, Yen Yang, Mengquan Ye, Efe Yonel, Chen Yu, Kenshan Yu, Shi Waoyan Yu, Xuan Yu, Ru Yu Zhang, Wenjian Zhang, Yanen John, Yunfen John, Zushi John, Sheng Zhao, Ying Zhao, Xia Zhou, Yi Kun Zhou, Yi Su Zhu, Jin Wao. Zoo. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Physical Sciences, I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Yang Yang Chung. Eric P. Hoy, Wenxin Li, Nian Lu, Lee Patrick McCullough, 
Eric H. Mine. Thomas David Montgomery. Winton Eric Moore. James T. Payne. Julius Rene Reyes. Alan Robinson. Francois Louis Henri Tissot. Chun John. Hao Zhe Ong. Tianyu Zheng. Jing Jiu. The Deputy Dean of the Division of the Social Sciences will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Social Sciences. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Social Sciences and the special programs approved by their departments. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the social sciences, and by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts, and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Chase Corbin. Si Young Ding. Robert Wolf Gross. Aaron Paul Hauska. Gregory Ray Montoya Mora. Kelsey London Robbins. Li Cheng Zhu. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of Social Sciences, I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Maria M. Akshirin. Christopher James Dingwall. Anna Yabloner. Kelda Ann Jameson. Sarah Elizabeth Johnson. Ainsley Nicole Leisure. <laughs> Louisa Marie McClintock. Ziyi Q. Joseph Julian Zines Weiss. Hai Zhao. The Dean of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business will now present candidates for the degree of Master of Business Administration in programs in the Booth School. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of professional studies prescribed by the faculty of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Business Administration. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Business Administration, and I express the hope that your work will further wise choices in the allocation of economic resources for the benefit of all people.
Raj Karan Akula, Stephen Andrew Balcom, Pritwi Raj Barman, Alexander Fitzpatrick Barnett, Stephen James Beckert, Joseph Robert Boleski, Nema Raquel Booker, Allison Marie Buckley, Bart Leland Burkhart, Jeffrey Calcagno, Matthew Caraselli Candela, Matthew Cullen Cavan, Hongying Chen, Zoe Chen, Elliot Alexander Cohen, Michael Patrick Cook, Akash Dewicker, Adam Cornelius Dunn, Jeff Malcolm Fallon, Megan Michelle Foley, Humberto Charles Frida, Scott Reed Freundlich, Michael Benjamin Friedman, Colt Michael Fernald, Michael Morris Glicken, Jack Carter Godshaw, Nidhi Gupta, Gregory Paul Har, Edward Powers Hansen, Dominic Xavier Poulin Heath, Brendan Michael Hula, Joshua James Jacob, Ajo Anto Joseph, Saket Kapoor, Matthew A. Katz, Cullen Ryan Keller, Gizam Kaysan, Anita R. Karwikar, Joseph C. Kim, Brian Herbert Kolb, Ketenya Kovori, Pavan K. Kundorthi, Lindsay Marie Lakiana, Rossi Laria, Marco Lazarevic, Robert Joseph Leith, Zachary Shaw Littleton, Michael Lucchese, Adam William McGee, Hazel Diana Mary, Ryan Madison, Thomas John McMillan, Asmat Mohammed, John Christopher Mullen Jr., James A. Murphy, Ramesh Navanit Hakrishnan, Duigu Pan, Adina Wana Puanesco, Jason Gaitan Pinnell, Megan Foy Palestra, David Martin Purcell Jr., Michelle Marie Retson, Kelly Christine Rothman, Kyle D. Ryback, 
Michael John Sawyer. Catherine Ann Schreff. Colin Russell Scott. Lillian Elaine Shaw. Andrew Dylan Yujo Shen. Scott Jared Smith. David Lauren Stefani. Emily Jane Stewart. Robert Joseph Strozak. Claudia Salkowski. Timothy Alexander Sylvain. Sebi Thomas. Sebastian Valenzuela Diaz. Vishal Verma. Luan Kim Villaverde. Minette Waiti. Sarah Wolf. Heyang Wu. Shui Sho. Sangha Yoon. Human Jung. Liang Liang Zhang. Qin Cheng Zhang. Yao Zhang. Darya Ziska. The Dean of Students of the Divinity School will now present a candidate for the degree of Master of Arts and candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Divinity School. Mr. President, the student I now present has completed a program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Divinity School for foundational education in the academic study of religion. I have the honor to present him as a candidate for the degree of Master of Arts. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts, and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Aubin Bennett Spice. <laughs> Mr. President, each of the students I now present have attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and each has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research in the academic study of religion. On behalf of the faculty of the Divinity School, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Jessica Hope Andrus. Andrew David DeCourt. The Dean of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies will now present candidates for the degree of Master of Public Policy in programs in the Harris School. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has completed the course of professional studies prescribed by the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Public Policy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Public Policy 
and I express the hope that your work will guide public policy toward the enhancement of the common good. John R. Fogg. Yu Zhu. A professor in the Institute for Molecular Engineering will now present candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Institute for Molecular Engineering. Mr. President, the student I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Institute for Molecular Engineering, I have the honor to present him as a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Lance David Williamson. The Dean of the Law School will now present candidates for the degree of Doctor of Law in programs in the Law School. Mr. President, these students have fulfilled all of the requirements prescribed by the faculty of the law school to qualify them for the profession of law. I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Law. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Law, and I express the hope that your work will contribute to the protection of liberty and the advancement of justice. Nathaniel Caleb Ahmed Stone. Ji Yoon Choi. Chun C. Wang. The Dean of Students of the School of Social Service Administration will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the School of Social Services Administration. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the School of Social Service Administration. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Arts. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts, and I express the hope that your work will promote the welfare of individuals and the achievement of a socially just society. Ian Harris Schroeder. Sarah Elizabeth Sheik. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the School of Social Service Administration, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I could confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Ellen G. Frank Miller. Teresa Talia Morrow.
Please rise for the singing of the university's alma mater. This is a special day for all of you upon whom I have just conferred a degree, and it is likewise a special day for the family, members, and friends who may be here to join you. It marks the completion of your study, or at least one phase of that study, a path that I trust has been challenging. I hope you're enjoying this moment of celebration and moment of reflection that this convocation affords. You are now all graduates of the University of Chicago. Because of your achievements that we celebrate here today with your family and friends, each of you will always be connected to the University of Chicago, a connection that I hope that you and we will foster for many years. The University of Chicago is an institution driven from its inception by an idea, an idea that one could create and continuously renew a university focused on rigorous, intense inquiry and analysis, and the environment of open and unfettered discourse necessary for such inquiry. The university, through its work every day, expresses the view that clarity derives from the clash of ideas, the challenge of assumptions, and the willingness to accept answers only when they meet the tests of argument. We seek understanding that is complex, expandable, and fluid, rather than simple and rigid. An understanding that reflects analysis rather than ideology, that accepts complexity over the comfort of simplicity, that seeks to delineate both the power and limitations of argument, and that is always ready to incorporate new data which can emerge and which in fact must be sought. We believe that the best education, the most empowering education, and the most powerful learning take place in the environment of constant challenge that is implicit in this culture of rigorous inquiry, and that this culture is responsible for producing ideas of power and importance for humankind. This focus on rigorous inquiry has defined the University of Chicago, its research, and its education at all levels since the university's beginning, and it continues to do so today. The university and its culture are renewed every day by the work of its faculty, students, and staff. And while, while it is natural to focus on your own achievements today and what they mean for your future, you can now also take great satisfaction in your contribution to the ongoing renewal of your university, the University of Chicago. I know that as graduates of this university in the coming years, you will be called upon to act, to speak, and to lead. And like so many University of Chicago graduates who have come before you, you will approach this challenge of leadership empowered by your University of Chicago education. The power of analysis and ideas that you have experienced here 
and that are now your own will serve you wherever your path takes you and whatever challenges you confront. Each of you who received the degree today has received help and support from parents, family, spouses, partners, children, friends, mentors, or university faculty and staff. And while it is your achievements that we mark today, all of these supporters can rightly take great pride in your accomplishment. And so to all degree recipients, please accept my congratulations for all that you have achieved. I wish you all good fortune and happiness in the years ahead. Enjoy your coming adventures wherever they may lead you. Congratulations.
This now concludes the 525th convocation of the University of Chicago. Crescat scientia vita excolatur. Let knowledge grow from more to more, and so be human life enriched. Thank <laughs> you.